Good morning, good afternoon. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maya. I am with uh, Vayer Medical, and I'm very happy to uh, host today's uh, webinar. Um, today, we are going to talk about uh, ventilator-associated events. Um, we're going to speak about new challenges and when known complications. And with us today, we have uh, Ruben Restrepo, Distinguished Teaching Professor, coming to us from the Department of Respiratory Care at UT Health in San Antonio. Uh, Ruben, hi, welcome, and thank you very much for taking the time today to uh, discuss this uh, subject with us. So thank everyone, you, you're welcome. There will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you have any questions, please pop them up in the Q&A. There will be some polls throughout the presentation. So make sure you take the time to answer. We will always leave around 30 seconds for, for everyone to be able to answer the poll. Ruben, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Maya. And thank you to Vaya for sponsoring this program. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a great topic to talk about. So I'm just hoping that, uh, could you please confirm that you see my slides? We do. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I think everyone is uh, very familiar with ventilator associated events, but I think everything is coming from uh, talking about ventilator associated pneumonia to start with. So there are some changes that have occurred uh, since 2013 that I'm going to just mention. Uh, but uh, first of all, let me just, uh, uh, just put my disclosures. So I'm an independent consultant and speaker for these companies, but uh, really nothing that I'm going to talk about uh, has to deal with these disclosures. So what I'm going to be using as the objective is, and really the outline is material that you can find easily from the CDC and the National Healthcare Safety Network. So of course, I'm going to describe the impact of mechanical ventilation because that's pretty much the source of the, all the VAEs, IBCs, and VAPs, of course. And uh, I'm going to and I'm going to place so much emphasis on the new definitions and describe actually how much of this uh, new definitions have impacted um, the uh, the risk and the diagnosis of VAEs and VACs. Um, I think everyone is uh, very aware that we need to have accurate ob objective measurements uh, for VAE. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to achieve your goals. And finally, I'm going to just briefly review some of the current strategies that you probably are aware of to prevent VAE. So let me start by saying that I think everyone knows that we ventilate a lot of patients. And I think it is not secret that uh, now during the pandemic, that is going to be almost two years now in the US, we ventilate just quite a number of uh, patients. It's calculated that roughly between, again, 250 and 400,000 every year in the US. And five to 10% of these ventilated patients develop what is called the now the VAE. I'm going to just highlight this guy here, Michael Klompas because he's probably one of the uh, uh, researchers who have put up most of the material that we know about ventilator associated pneumonia and VA. So he's very well known, and I have a review for you to share at the end. Everyone knows that once we put the patient on the ventilator, um, as much as we want to save lives, there is no question that there are so many ventilator associated uh, complications. The patient is, uh, is, is not able to move. Uh, we have we can cause morbidities. We have we have a way to actually, believe it or not, kill the patient on the ventilator, ventilator induced lung injury. But as you can see, many of these complications now have been just tabled in regards to a clear definition. That's why you have VAC, the IVAC, and the VAP. So we're going to just briefly just mention some of those. When you really see the impact of mechanical ventilation on survival, it's actually very key. But ventilator associated pneumonia has been one of those issues because at some point, it could become the second leading cause of death in patients in the ICU associated with infections. If you see the overall mortality is about 35% for ventilated patients, but of course, as you get older, the, the mortality gets a little bit higher. So when we were talking about possible complications of mechanical ventilation, you have to keep in mind that they are not exactly the same. So when you talk about ventilated associated complications, most of them relate to the fluid overload, pulmonary edema, about 10 to 15% atelectasis, 
uh, 5 to 20% ARDS. And the other variable, other than the VAC, will be your infection-related ventilator-sustaining condition, which is going to be your pneumonia. This could be as high as 40%. So some of the risk factors that have been always discussed for VAEs is sedation, uh, the, let's say the use of propofol, uh, volume, of course, overload, the use of high tidal volumes, the high driving pressures. Uh, there's a controversy about the oral uh, chlorhexidine, blood transfusions, uh, patient transport, even the stress ulcer prophylaxis could be a risk factor. So there has been just a, just a lot of changes over the last 10 years about what is good and what is not so good to prevent ventilator associated complications. Now, when we deal with the complications, uh, just a, again, just a reminder that they are typically attributable to pneumonia, pulmonary edema, atelectasis, or ARDS. And all of this are going to prolong the length of stay in the ICU. So now we have a question for you guys. So is VAP still an issue in your institution? Yes or no? Answer are coming up. I appreciate that. Very good. I don't think it is going to change so much. So yeah, just keep answering. But it, it seems like half, uh, half of you answered yes. Uh, still an issue. And I think it's going to still be an issue as long as we have patients ventilated more than five days. That's going to be critical. And I appreciate the fact that you don't know because in instances, we work in the ICU, but we are not extremely aware of protocols or bundles that are taking place. So thank you for your answers. So let me just close this. When, we, when we're talking about VAEs, VACs, there's no question that we have to stop and think about the impact of VAP. And these are really relatively old numbers, but they're still very, very actual, very current numbers. Crude mortality could be as high as 50%. So that means that if you have a patient diagnosed with VAP, there's almost a 50% chance of this patient's dying. And the cost associated with this has been calculated, again, between 10 and 50,000. Probably the number that I have seen the most over the years, over the last 20 years, has been about 40,000. So it's very expensive. But also in regards to now a much shorter length of stay in the ICU today, this could add four to seven days on top of this. So if your length of stay in the ICU in the typical medical ICU is about four days before the patient gets discharged, or free of mechanical ventilation, just add just one more week to this. You know for a fact that the ICU is not a good place to be and uh, you're going to get sicker the longer you stay in the ICU. And something to keep in mind also is that not, lo not, not only you can stay longer in the ICU, but your hospital length of stay could be as long as two weeks just because of this. So now we have the second question for you. So is the new diagnostic criteria for VAE, VAC, and IVAC clear to you? Excellent. So, so if we have more than 50% answering yes, this is where we end the presentation. It's actually pretty good. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, over half of you have a clear understanding. So I'm hoping that when you answer no, and I don't know, if you work in the ICU, that's something that we ought to revisit because that's going to be extremely, extremely important to uh, keep in mind. So let's review. So the old uh, VAP pathogenesis. So, you know, every single, every single time you have the endotracheal tube, now you're imposing risks. But there's a significant role just behind the biofilm. That's the reason why you have so many suction devices these days to hopefully prevent VAP. When you have the cough, you have to keep in mind, of course, that you have not a perfect cough because you don't want to be this too tight against the mucosa. So some of that will allow the subglottic secretions to go down, to trickle down. 
And that's the reason why you have some blood secretion suctioning in some cases. And then finally, the pulse secretions will be just either pushed down by the suction catheter or distributed by, by mechanical ventilation. And I believe this is actually, that this, this dispersal of biofilm is extremely important to this day. But let's go ahead and just uh, see why the new definition has been just uh, so difficult to, to be accomplished fully in the ICU. So remember, this goes this dates back to 2013. And one of the reasons why this is so difficult is because nobody has come with really a good agreement, even if you pull experts that previously were able to diagnose VAPs, now there is no longer this consistency among just uh, clinicians. So this is again studied in 2010 by uh, Dr. Klompas, but then there's one more uh, by uh, Fagon, just published in 1993. And still to this day, again, uh, this is valid data. This is a result of 84 patients in the ICU, and you see only about after, just with the previous criteria, abnormal chest X-rays and pure and sputum, only 32% of patients were diagnosed with that. But just to give you a little bit more of detail on how this goes, let me show you that 42% of physicians or physicians disagreed on presence or absence of VAP in 35 out of 84. Now, take a look at this data, 24 versus 50%. So 20% of the most accurate doctors missed through VAPs, while 50% of the least accurate doctors missed through VAPs. So if you're not heavily exposed to this, there's a good chance that you miss one out of the two cases. But still, missing one out of one out of three when you have expertise, that would be concerning. 20% of patients misdiagnosed with VAP from both groups. Misdiagnosed. So again, one of, out of those five patients may not be recognized with VAP. That could be that when you have a high mortality up to 50%, that could be detrimental. So there's no question the, the reason why the National Healthcare and Safety Network, CDC, and all other medical associations have come up with trying to define this a little bit better. Because if you define this in a fashion that is going to be recognized by clinicians, it's going to determine maybe a decreased rate of this event or something that is going to be more preventable. What is, the, what is the framework? The framework is to create objective definition, streamlined, something that could potentially automate and to you have to define exactly what type of patient uh, or what type of mechanical ventilation you're keeping, you're keeping mind of. So what types of mechanical ventilation are included in this case? So in general, you can think that all types of mechanical ventilation, but then the non-more conventional, which is going to be high frequency oscillatory ventilation at ECMO are going to be excluded. But then you are, we are going to also exclude IPPV, any form of uh, just uh, external, just nasal PEEP or nasal CPAP. And APRB to a certain extent. So I would say most mechanical ventilated patients are going to be included in this type of group for just uh, surveillance. When we are to break down the VAE definition, we have to think about the respiratory status component. So that means that from the time the patient is on mechanical ventilation for more than two days, that's the event. The event is that you have the patient on the ventilator. But if the patient stays stable, let's say for at least two days, and then is followed by a sustained period of worsening oxygenation, I'm going to just give you more details about this. Now you have a ventilated associated complication. Only until you recognize the VAC, if you have a general evidence of infection and inflammation, I'm going to give you the two criteria. Now you're going to have the infectious, infectious VAC, so IVAC. And only until you have positive results of microbiological testing, you're going to have either the possible or probable BAP. So let me just uh, show you that CDC, I'm not going to review this, but provides you with a very specific detail in this document. This document is, is updated, so you're welcome to review. So this is one of the resources that you can just have, just paste it in the ICU if you need to, just in case, again, you are rotating to the ICU and you are one of the 21, 23% that had no knowledge 
of this uh, clear criteria. So just to remind you, on VAC, the patient will have to be intubated for two calendar days, so that means that the earliest day that you could document the event is going to be calendar day three. But you're gonna have these two calendar days that really are stable. So that means that the patient has to be stable or improving baseline, just preceding the day that something happens. And what happens is either increase the amount of PEEP or the FIO2. So this is the key. Daily minimum PEEP values increase more than three centimeters of water over the previous two days that have been completely stable or greater than 20% increase in the FIO2 over those two days that you add to mark to be completely stable. And this PEEP or FIO2 must be maintained for at least more than one hour. So let's just practice for just a little bit. So this is the case, the, the, the case of the example number one. And you can see the daily minimum PEEP over the first six days, and you have the FIO2. So what would you say is the answer? Or when do you think a VAC actually occurs? So if you take a closer look, what you're going to determine is that the zero, and also to keep in mind, probably just for more one, more one example that, that I have is between zero and five is considered exactly the same. So because you have two and you go to five, that is not really considered an increase of PEEP. It has to be above five centimeters of water. So in this particular case, day three and day four are the stable days. And then you have an increase of three centimeters of water over this. This is day five. This is when you're going to mark or document for, for this particular patient that you have a VAC. What about this one? So again, you go, you have one, do, one, two, three, the first three days, you go from zero to five, but then you have a day at five, and then you have eight and eight, let's say with minimal changes in the FIO2 or no changes in the FIO2. So, so the day that you're going to mark your VAC is going to be day five because you have two stable days. So you may think that three is different to five, but for the criteria, three and five are going to be considered the same. So these are two days of stable uh, PEEP and then increase on day five. One more example. So you have all of this here. And what is going to happen when you try to determine if you have a VAC or VAE? So the VAE starts actually with the first two days of mechanical ventilation. Now, what you see here is that the VAC is when you have, you see two stable days. This doesn't meet the criteria according to PEEP, but of course, in this particular case, there is a 30% increase in your FIO2 after two stable days. And this is when you mark your VAC. This is example number four. So you see day one through day six, you see the daily minimum PEEP, 865566. And then you see the daily minimum FIO2. As you can clearly see, there's no event. There's really no complication here because there's no really, after you have the 40 to 70, this is maybe a 30% increase, but you don't have really two stable days to count on on the, pre on the previous two days. So this, this is not an event. What about the IVAC? So this is for the VAC. For the IVAC, as I mentioned before, you still have to have uh, the, uh, the VAC, of course, has to be diagnosed. So this has to be marked. It has to, this has to be, be recognized before you mention the IVAC. But the two criterion, and again, on after calendar day three of mechanical ventilation, and within two calendar days before or after the onset of oxygen and oxygenation. And it is based on two criteria, temperature and white blood cell count. So the temperature could be, and as the same with the white blood cell count, it could go both ways. You could have a patient who is extremely hyperthermic or extremely hypothermic. Same with extremely uh, patient with leukocytosis or leukopenia. Why? Because the two extremes in terms of temperature and white blood cell could indicate uh, fulminant infection at some point. And the criteria number two will be a new antimicrobial is studied and continued for at least four calendar days. So when you look at this table, 
it is very easy to get confused. And that's why we have the, the other questions. So Maya will show you this question. But while, while we get the responses for that, I'm going to mention to you that it is, it is important to know that the uh, CDC definition changed again back in 2013. And back in those days, you had to count on a low PF ratio and you have to count on purulent secretions and of course the new, uh, the new infiltrate. And now the, uh, the new definition is based more on the strength of the increased ventilator settings. Because there's no question that a ventilator associated complication will be, again, transparent to you as a clinician if you have to go up in the parameters. In this case, what they have been chosen to, to be the determinant ones is PEEP and FIO2. And also for the IVAC, now it's going to be the gram stain, neutrophil count, particularly the neutrophil count, and the new start of the antibiotic. Very good. So... It's interesting that uh, most of you believe that the new definition has resulted in a lower, higher, a lower or higher number of cases. So that means that it doesn't stay the same, but it varies. So let's see. We'll, we'll see exactly what happens. So believe it or not, if you answer yes or no, uh, you're kind of just exactly right because it is all over the place. So take a look at the study from 2015. Again, this is two years. Remember that the criteria for the uh, VAE was changed after the committee met for almost two years, from 2011 to 2013, until they were finally published. And now it makes sense to study what is the VAP prevalence based on the new definitions, and it is all over the place. So there is no consistency. That's what makes extremely challenging just being able to recognize VAP. And if you remember, if you are working at this institution where there has been so much pressure to keep zero VAP, there's no question that, again, for a group like this, it doesn't matter if it's Johansson or not, it is easier or, let's say, more productive to report a zero VAP or lower VAP versus just being completely honest, like the clinical pulmonary infection score that actually just, again, shut up the, uh, the number of VAPs. So it is very inconsistent. So this is one of the topics that is not going to settle for quite some time. So kind of just the message here could be being vigilant. And so the safety program for mechanical value patients also has some examples, the AHRQ. So one more example of how, again, how critical it is going to be for those who monitor uh, ventilator associated complication is going to be. So now again, the, the criteria will be PEEP values increase over three centimeters of water based on two calendar days that are stable or the FIO2 greater than 20%. So what would you think about this? Is this a ventilator associated complication? Again, take a quick look at minimum PEEP just to see when it became stable. And when it became stable, did something happen in regards to increase? And when does it happen? Okay. So the key, the, the key here is that whatever is highlighted may not be exactly what the answer is going to be. So you have two stable days, and then you go from people five to eight. So on day seven, you have a ventilated associated complication. Let's try that again. So in this case, the emphasis is going to be on the FIO2 day one through day 10. And it is, a, it is a, a matter of recognizing if you have a BAC and when do you have it. So in this particular case, just realize that you have two days of stability and then you have 20% higher on day five. So this day five is where you have a BAC. Now, one more example, example number three. So now you, you don't have any years of this, uh, this uh, parameter being highlighted. So you have to just kind of just figure exactly, have you had any period of stability before? So in this particular case, let's just highlight this. So the minimum file two, 55, but again, it goes to 50, it increases to 70. But when it goes to 70, I don't have two days. I don't have two days of previous stability. So I have six and five. So this cannot be exactly the day of the uh, uh, VAC. 
Same with this, you have stability here, but then you don't have an increase in three centimeters of water. So what it means is that you do have a patient seven, 10 days, 14 days, but you may not have a ventilated associated complication as a result of the new criteria. Something that is very important to, to realize is that there have been uh, multiple studies trying to focus on prevention because that's probably just the key. It is uh, much more difficult to document a diagnosis when you don't have a clear criteria. But something else is that, and again, not to discourage everyone, but there are a number of studies that have been testing uh, just all these strategies of the bundle and they are still a little bit inconsistent. You know for a fact that if you minimize sedation, that you, if you are able to pair the uh, daily sedation uh, trial or the uh, spontaneous awakening trials and also the spontaneous breathing trials, you can get better results. And I think ultimately we'll just uh, trickle down to trying to prevent this. One of the reasons why this is so important is because some of them have been ventilated for more than five days. Take a look at this. 79% of VAEs were in patients who were either on mechanical ventilation for more than five days or in the hospital for more or, or five days at the time of VAE onset. So there's no question that during this period of mechanical ventilation, prior to gaining stability and disruption or deterioration, there's something that we, can do, we could probably do as clinicians. But always the question is, where do you start? Now, this is where we have one more question for you guys. So the, the first way to, to see when to start and where to start is what do we have in place? What do you have as an institution in place that you can take a look and look back and of course, from that point on, track your own performance over time? This requires heavy documentation, that's for sure. If documentation is not, that's why you have really a committee in your institution taking care of this. It is not going to be the regular clinician. The regular clinician is going to be making sure that once you are provided with the documentation and let's say forms or chart, the spaces in the chart for you to document, you're going to provide that information for the committee to analyze uh, so they can go back to the ICU and say, this is where, where we stand this month or this week of this six months or this year. And then based on what you have done, you can determine if you have seen any improvements. But I think the key, the key part of the improvements is not only on how you feel about diagnosing VAC, but are you really good doing the right thing? And I'm going to just mention again, few, few things that have changed in regards to the bundle that we used to know for quite some time. So prevention strategies have been based on the fact that it, 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 VAP is a critical issue. So even, even from the 2014, after the new VAE, VAC, IVAC, um, possible and probable VAP, uh, you have just a bunch of institutions that have been contributing to this, uh, this amount of work. So some of that is being able to determine that you could pick from a menu what you're planning on doing for VAE reduction. And as you see, there are some basic practice, special approaches, and generally not recommended. But it's interesting because I'm going to show you something. Generally not recommended silver-coated ET tubes. I don't know how many of you have used this or you have seen the literature on it's a, a good quality amount of papers just uh, uh, supporting the fact that the silver-coated endotrial tubes prevented that. And now you see some of the uh, some of the guidelines saying generally not recommended. This is the same case with re, uh, regular oral care with uh, chlorhexidine. Now you look at the literature and it's questionable. I went to just share that with you. But there's so many interventions that you can include in the bundle. And sometimes what is recommended is to start with few that are very key, that the team feels so comfortable that there's no question that this must be included in your bundle. So I think this is going to be hopefully the last question for you, but one more question. Does your institution routinely apply a VAE, VAC bundle? Good. 
right? And that's what I was expecting to see. So almost 70% of you have answered that yes. So if you if you are in the group of no, that 12%, uh, I would be concerned. I would be concerned because um, either you call it something else, but there's no question that you are instituting or you're applying interventions to reduce VAE and VAC. There's no question in my mind that's actually the case. But if you don't know and you are working in the ICU or you're a student and you are not only becoming familiar with this, next time you have orientation in one of those ICUs, just ask, what is the, the protocol or what is the official bundle in this ICU to prevent VACs, IVAC, and uh, VAP? Something that be on the list, the next step is to document. That means that whatever you select, in this case, if you're doing continuous subglottic suctioning, if you do the SBTs, if you do the SATs, which is spontaneous awakening trials, if you're ambulating the patients, if you have regular mouth care with or without uh, uh, chlorexidine, I'm going to give you just one exception for the chlorexidine today that may be related to better outcomes. Elevate head of the bed. So whatever you choose to be your bundle, well, is this something that when you assess, you are or you are not doing? And this is the key part of the documentation to see if you have, again, a good committee and a good representation to go after this data. Because trust me, it's going to just be extremely important in determining what the cost is going to be associated with every single patient. I want to mention to you that you don't have to start from scratch. There are so many protocols that are many suggestions to, again, what should be a VAE uh, bundle. So you have some of this and you see, what about elevate the head of the bed? 30 to five degrees, use the visual cues, cues identify the signated staff member to check head of, the, uh, head of the bed elevation on each shift. So this is a plan. This is also again, very popular. Uh, I learned actually from the guy or from the guys who created this in uh, Virginia. The ABCDF, extremely popular because uh, it, it allows the patients to get out. And uh, particularly this, I was very impressed when I saw the first video just years ago at CHEST, uh, early progressive mobilization and ambulation. It takes a team to be able to accomplish this. In many ICUs that I've seen around the world, it, this doesn't happen. Too complicated, we don't have the staff, we don't have the resources, but it's so key just trying to move the patient out because it will prevent a lot of VACs. Then something very important is this, plan, do, study, and act. And keep in mind that when you plan, do not reinvent the wheel. I mean, so if you want to be known for just being the institution that created just a, such a brand new SAT, SBT protocol, but for the most part, there are so many out there. There are so many good examples to actually just copy that is just worthwhile trying to implement versus trying to create or design something. There are, again, uh, sources like this. This is from the 2018 latest Community Event Top 10 Checklist. This is, again, in place, not done, will adopt, notes. So as you can see, in order to be able to accomplish uh, the prevention of these uh, VAEs, VACs, and so forth, it takes a lot of documentation. It takes a very well-organized team to put this together. One more example is this. It's up. Head of the bed, 30 to 45 degrees, enteral feeding and every two hours of oral care, air mattress and turn every two hours, DVT prophylaxis. I mean, some of this is important. Sedation, vacation, ulcer prophylaxis. I mean, it's a controversial issue, pain control. And then for every single tool that you implement, there's an algorithm that you can find. This is the wake up and breathe protocol. This is trying to just uh, put in a bundle the spontaneous awakening trials and the spontaneous breathing trials because it makes sense. The more awake you keep the patient, the more you're going to be able to perform a spontaneous breathing trial, the sooner you're going to be able to get the tube out. Then you have a protocol for the early progressive mobility. Move, 
myocardial stability, oxygenation adequate on these parameters, FiO2 that is great, less than 60%, PEEPs that are less than 10, minimal vasopressors, and engages the voice. And then you implement this on basic levels. To put in perspective, some of the issues that have occurred with some of the strategies that we used to do every single time in the ICU, what about oral care with chlorexidine? This shows exactly the evolution <clears throat> of these strategies. Routine oral care with chlorexidine prevents nosocomalemonia in cardiac surgery patients. So now we're coming down to when would you use the subglottic suctioning? Is that routinely? When will you use a double-coated endotracheal tube? When will you use chlorexidine? Because if it is non-cardiac surgery patients, if you are in a non-cardiac non, in a non unit, you may not decrease VAP. And in fact, it may actually go a different way. It doesn't affect mortality, duration of mechanical ventilation, or ICU length of stay. So if you just wonder why your institution changed from just oral care with chlorexidine to not, is because now it, one of the things is, that has to do is with the... Uh, the amount of pooling of secretions of this biofilm that is, believe it or not, has been just uh, associated with more VAP. So again, results of the uh, evidence change, and with that, it changes practice. That's what you're supposed to be doing. The reason why I wanted to emphasize on this, uh, this is now a different, so pre prevention of ventilator-associated pneumonia by noble metal coating of endotracheal tubes. This is a multi-center randomized double blind study, as good as gold, brand new. I mean, it just came out. Just to show the point that only because in the past something has been proven to, correct, to be correct and then it loses evidence, there's no reason to keep, continue studying this in, in a very particular group of patients. It shows the effort on trying to combat as much as you can, the ventilated associated pneumonia. I would say that in general, if you're going to apply just very good techniques, it's going to be just by implementing head of the bed elevation, of, to, of course, trying to avoid pulmonary complications, because remember, through fluid conservation, this is one of the most important complications that you have as a VAC on the list of VAC, fluid conservation, trying to prevent these patients from not coming with pulmonary edema. And the next one that could be as high as 40% is against atelectasis by managing sedation. Why? Because the more awake the patient, the more mobile the patient, less atelectasis the patient will have. Combat acute lung injury. Remember, ARDS, as we know, it is acute respiratory distress syndrome could be induced. Again, some people just uh, coined this term uh, villi when poor ventilator has nothing to do. It should be silly clinician-induced lung injury. But that's exactly what ventilator-induced lung injury is. So pa patients who do, who do not have an acute respiratory distress syndrome, now it has been induced by the way we manage patients. Sometimes what I've seen on just a few studies that we have participated uh, with our uh, master's students is that, yes, we are probably doing better with the implementation of low tidal volume, we can, but we continue with the copy and paste tidal volume where everyone is on 400, when the low tidal volume strategy is not individualized. So if you get a lot of information, if you get a lot of data from your institution, so how would you use this to drive improvements? So something, <coughs> excuse me, Something that is going to be important is going to review both individual cases and system level, level issues. You have to develop a system that you determine uh, with your staff, how are you going to review this with the staff? Because the staff is actually taking care of patients and they're going to be just uh, driving this boat if you, if you are an administrator, providing the resources to make this happen. So when it comes to this cost, it's not going to be just penalizing the staff saying, Look at this rates, but this is probably because we are not doing something right. One of the keys of this uh, 20, still in my mind, 21, 20, 23%, we have no idea is, well, do we have policies and procedures in place? I haven't worked in too many ICUs. I mean, so I'm, most of my time 
I spent as a clinician working was in a pediatric ICU. Trust me, uh, I had to be aware of policies and procedures. So policies and procedures in place have to be including, of course, VAE, VAC management. The key is, and I know it is a challenge, because again, as a, clin as a clinician and also as a researcher, I know how it is to tell something that we do this time and two years later, we have to reevaluate because the evidence is different. But the key is that the evidence-based guidelines are created to provide or to offer patients the, the best care possible. Something that happens, even has happened over the last 20, almost 22 years in June, Again, remember published in JAMA, the ARSNET protocol. It's been going to be almost 22 years. Do you think that after we proved that low tidal volume strategy, decreased mortality, every single institution is consistent with this? And it's been published for 22 years. Yes, we have learned more about driving pressures, uh, stress index, more sophisticated tools that allow us to probably reduce that mortality. But even a practice as common as that, is even inconsistent. So there's no question that we have opportunities for improvement. And some of those could be just hardwired ambulation protocols. And just to make sure that clearly, the key word, document, document. And if you are a nurse or a physician and you are not a respiratory therapist, trust me that working with respiratory therapists will be just a significant improvement in your protocol and your policies and procedures or your committee. And sometimes, depending on how serious it is, you have to really just have daily, daily meetings. Committees typically do this when they have a way to improve uh, just the outcomes. If you have the outcomes, this is when you actually can relax and say, you know what, it doesn't make sense to meet every day. Now let's meet every week, but only when you have the outcomes they're looking for. But the good news uh, for everyone who's listening today, uh, we really appreciate that you're taking the time to do this. If it is your morning, if it is your early morning or late afternoon, it's because you're not alone. And there are plenty of resources. So in this particular case, uh, I, I like the Vanderbilt ICU. Uh, again, they, they implemented so many protocols uh, and I had the privilege of working with uh, one of the creators of this uh, ABCDEF uh, bundle at CHEST. But many of them, you see, all of these are available to you. But it's also uh, something that put together um, by this uh, type of committee is preventing ventilator city events, 2018 update. And I finally wanted to leave you with uh, just a couple of papers that I would like for you to take into consideration. One is this, uh, again, written by Michael Klumpas, an expert, I would say an authority on ventilator associated events, what they are and what they're not. So this was published in Respiratory Care in 2019. This is the reference here. So this is uh, the month of uh, August. This is where you can find what it is and what is not, just to review. And a good friend of mine, uh, Rich Khaled, uh, just published this also in 2019. The same issue was dedicated to ventilator associated events and pneumonia. Ventilated bundles in transition. And this is the key word, in transition, because what we knew 20 years ago, 10 years ago, has been changing. So we have to keep up with, again, the information that has been just published up there. Certainly recommend looking at the Cochrane, uh, Cochrane analysis, the meta-analysis, but also look for the review, PubMed, just to see what is over there, how, how they have evolved from 2013. Again, it's going to be almost nine years since this, this uh, VAE were redefined. Now, let me end with a quote from Linda Green, a nurse uh, who says, surveillance is a critical component of every quality improvement effort. You cannot prevent it if you cannot measure it, but you cannot measure it if you are not able to know how to diagnose it. So the bottom line is this. VACs are associated with increased mortality in ICU and hospital long to stay. At some point, you, your friend, your family member, or somebody who you don't know is going to die because of these issues. In randomized controlled trials, VAC interventions have been shown to improve objective outcomes, such as duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU or hospital length of stay, 
mortality, and cost. I think at this point, everything that you read about VAC, VAE, and particularly VAP prevention is probably the best guide to see the type of outcomes that you're looking for. The fourth point is that it is important to continue monitoring the process of care and the outcomes for mechanical, mechanically ventilated patients. And the last point, always give feedback to providers and assess the potential for preventable events. So with that, I want to thank everyone uh, just for being here again, uh, particularly Via for sponsoring this program. I really appreciate the, the, the help that I've gotten from um, Maya and Julie. I know that Maya is uh, just a little bit late in Paris, but I just envy the fact that you're there. So if we have, if we have some questions, uh, Maya? Yes, we absolutely do. We have two questions in the Q&A. So the first one that popped up was, how can the therapist determine whether the respiratory disease process that caused the patient to be intubated is getting worse as opposed to categorizing the patient's deterioration as a ventilator acquired event? That's very key. Um, very good question. And the answer is refer to the table. All you have to do is determine, okay, could, could the patient come to the ICU already, already with an issue? Remember it, that almost 75% of those patients could, could have been hospitalized five days before coming to the ICU for some, some reason. But from the time the patient is intubated, just again, that's where you start the count. So what you need to do is create a little table on saying, okay, day one, the patient was intubated. I'm being able to monitor exactly what happened to that, that, to that FIO2 and PEEP, trying to determine which two days the FIO2 or the PEEP were stable before something deteriorated. That becomes a VAC. So to the question is, well, could it be something that the patient had? Yes, but it is a VAC. What you want to do is make sure that whatever you have control over in regards to head of the way, head of the bed of elevation, uh, subglottic suctioning, uh, again, DVT prophylaxis. So you, you get to start doing that no matter if after implementing all of this, the patient had already something previous to that that, that you could treat as a comorbidity that caused the EAC to occur. So it's a good question because you may have control over a few things, but some of this could already come with the patient prior to you uh, intubating the patient. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came up um, was, with the suggestion of using low tidal volumes and knowing HMEs should not be used in low tidal volume practices, when should active humidification, humidification be used or started? That's a good question. Let me, let, let me just answer this. So if I am uh, just um, here uh, in front of a European audience, HMEs are the way to go. If you're in the U.S., you got to be careful because uh, low tidal volumes have to be really extremely low tidal volumes. The way we do low uh, tidal volume uh, protective strategy does not contraindicate the use of HMEs. So HMEs are going to be still very good because you are not using two, three, four mLs per kilogram. So typically you're using about five, six mLs per kilogram. That is not a contraindication for HMEs. Keep in mind though, if you're concerned about the tidal volume, you also keep in mind that the protocol that typically is put in place is a combination of a low tidal volume with a little bit higher rate. Higher rate. So that higher minute volume is going to feed enough into the HME. If completely opposite, if you are relying only on a very, very low tidal volume in mLs per kilogram, and on a very low rate, which is, it would be rare to see. So in that particular case, I would be concerned and then you use active humidification. I think at this point, uh, active versus passive has not found any correlation in regards to preventing ventilated acid pneumonias. And I think there's a, I can actually just read this question here. What is your opinion on active humidification? Uh, Active humidification in the prevention of VAP has not been proved. Well, the only key that I would have to say is that when you use active humidification 
And again, uh, as a clinician, I have to say that in most cases, we have a tendency to ignore something that is very important. Not that the active humidification is on, is about temperature. Are we optimizing temperature so the patient has adequate relative humidity in the airways? Or is the temperature low? And then we're going to be dealing with the fact that the patient is going to have higher amount of condensate. So um, both passive humidification and active humidifications are very good, if very well used. And nowadays, HMEs have proven in some, again, some parts of Europe use this for 96 hours. But you have to be using the right HME. Not every single HME is made uh, equal. All right. Um, another question here um, is ETT with built-in subglottic suction. Any evidence for or against? There, there is evidence, uh, particularly in the past. I, I really haven't seen something this, uh, let's say, dramatically uh, new. But there's no question that on patients who will have a tendency to stay a little bit longer on the ventilator, there's a, there's a true benefit. You have to balance how much it is going to cost to your institution to put in place a bundle protocol without the need of subglottic suctioning. Subglottic suction is not cheap. So are you doing the other things in a bundle and then you may be excluding or selecting the subglottic suctioning for patients who are going to be the same way with the silver coated. Are you in the trauma ICU where you may actually be using? So if you have a trauma ICU, maybe subglottic suction is something that you want to do routinely. Maybe silver coated as just, uh, just reserved for patients if you have the resources, because the literature again supports some of that, but it has been changing so much. So I, I think my approach will be take a look at a protocol at your institution that you can follow without making uh, significant expenses to start with, but without risking one that is essential. If you are not waking, if you're not doing the SATs, spontaneous waking in trials, it doesn't matter if you use subglottic suctioning. It doesn't matter if you use silver, gold, or copper coated endotracheal tubes, you're missing the boat. There are elements that are evidence-based guidelines uh, supported I will go for that, and then I will look at the evidence and see, okay, can we collectively, and our teams can actually help with this, can we collectively define or determine if it is worth routinely applying subglottic suction into the patients? All right, we still have time for some questions. I see more questions are coming up, so we'll try to take them by order uh, in which they came. So. Um, do hospitals do things like only increasing P by two centimeters to artificially decrease the AE? Uh, ask the question again. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the question says, do hospitals do things like only increasing P by two centimeters to artificially decrease the AE? And there was a small discussion um, that says we start <laughs> at six and not five of feet for all patients when low PEEP is appropriate. It, yeah, that's a that's a very good point, and it's been going on honestly since the time we started the pressure for VAP. Remember that when uh, it's funny, uh, interesting. In one of the ARCs years ago, I had a pro con with uh, with Marco Restrepo, an expert on pneumonia, that latest pneumonia and community acquired pneumonia. And uh, so my point was to defend that VAP uh, zero VAP was possible. And, uh, and he ended up with a slide that actually killed me at the end saying, well, this is actually, actually a very good way, very good way to get zero VAP. And he showed a slide with the, with the empty bed. So yes, you could have that. Also, you could have additional diagnosis of this. So I don't mean to, I want to sound politically correct, that there's sometimes way to manipulate things in regards to saying, nah, it's not really VAP, it's actually VAT is ventilated city tracheitis. Well, you report less VAP. So maybe you, you report less VAE, VAE when you actually just go by two, when in reality, you know that this spacing has to be increased by three or four centimeters of water, sometimes by five. I, I don't think we have really control of that, but I think if you are a clinician observing this every single time, so rates of VAE, VACs are documented to be less, 
I think I will probably just again try just to call on one upon just one and saying, uh, is this is is this a particular reason why we're doing this report less VAEs or is this a, is this evidence based practice? Very hard to ask this question in the ICU, to be honest with you. All right. Um, okay, let's see. So what's the appropriate measures to prevent VAE with COVID-19 patients? Wow, uh, that's tough. Um, one of the key aspects of managing patients uh, with COVID today is, uh, of course, to prevent uh, high mortality rates. Uh, there's no question that once the patient has uh, COVID, one of the most um, important pathophysiological events that occur is pneumonia. So would you call that a VAC? It's a ventilator complication, but the patient already comes sick. I mean, it's five days with pneumonia. So uh, is that really a complication? According to the new guidelines, that's something that has to be defined according to the table. I mean, you have to really just meet that criteria. You could say we are not going to document this as an IVAC because the patient came sick. But the reality is that you're going to be treating these patients this, just the same way as everybody else. The only problem is that the bundle has to be dramatically changed. Why? Because you're proning these patients. And if you're proning these patients 16 hours, what is the head of the ablation just come into place? Well, how, how are you doing your proning to just uh, comply with this? So COVID is a challenge that allows you to be confused about, should we treat the patients as ARDAs or not? And I believe that at this point, the literature has been clear and the, we, we have really nothing very clear uh, from the studies from Gary Noni that said that this is not the typical ARDS. We should not be managing this patient the same way to just knowing at this point that ventilator associated complications could be prevented with the same bundles. But you really have to adapt to the fact that most of the spaces are going to be prone. If you really want to save your life, proning is going to be critical. So that becomes an exception to the rule where it becomes much more, much more important to save patients during the COVID than trying to under or over report VAE or VACs. All right. Um, there's a question here. It's common to set up a vent on five centimeters H2O and if an increase is needed in PEEP, it's moved to eight. How do you break this culture? Um, well, we have routine numbers. Remember that in the old days, uh, if you go back to Andreas Esteban's studies on mechanical ventilation, you could find that many institutions back 20 or 15 years ago when he uh, published his first uh, survey of mechanical violation, we're still using PEEP of zero. And now uh, PEEP of five became uh, the arbitrary number. And then when you know that you ventilate, when you intubate a patient, realize that the patient has very poor oxygenation because you have been playing around with high flow nasal or non-invasive with a very high CPAP, five is no longer the case, but it's going to be probably eight. And eight has become a really popular number. Going from five to eight, it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the same as the FiO2. Which, which way would you ventilate your patients? At 100% to start with or 50%? I think the key is that you stay at the bedside and determine if you're going to start at 50%, I will be able to tell in a few minutes if the patient needs 60% or 70%. Same way with the PEEP. I don't think I would criticize at, at all going from five to eight is determining if eight is going to be the really, really the solution to the problem. Do you really have a good response to eight? If that is your recruitment maneuver at this point, uh, you have to determine that probably eight may not be enough. So some institutions or some protocols will say, well, if you're going to pre-increase the PEEP, might as well increase this by five. A matter is one of those that say, if you want to use PEEP, use it. But use it with a rationale, just not simply just by increasing PEEP. So I don't see anything wrong with going from five to eight. Honestly, that change in three centimeters of water has been probably more popular and older 
than the newer definitions for BAE. I don't think it has anything to do with BAE. I think what you have to discover is, is this change motivated by the new definition of BAE? Well, that would be probably just a different answer. All right, and this is the last question we're gonna take, even though we're, we still have questions uh, coming in. Um, the question is, um, is there an indication or protocol for the frequency of bronchoalveolar lavages? This is one of my students. I'm going to kill him. Uh, so <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there's no indication for. There's no really a protocol for the frequency. Uh, uh, frequency of BALs. Uh, BAL is one of those uh, issues, Mohana, that has been all over the place. Uh, in the past, they had such a significant importance. I think now. If you take a look at the BALs and the microbiological count or report, it's really at the bottom where you're getting to just make a difference between, are you going to say this is a probable VAP or a possible VAP? It comes down to that. So I think in most cases, you are not going to have really a routine uh, use of um, BALs unless they are clearly indicated. So that means that now you have a protocol where you have to just start with the BAE Suspect that you can always get to v, to the VAP to be able to document, but VAE first, then VAC, then IVAC, and then you come to that and saying, okay, at this point, we're getting so close to having a patient with hypothermia, hyperthermia, a leukocytosis, leukopenia, might as well just determine if we have a ventilated, ventilated pneumonia, that will be the time probably for a BAL. And, uh, but there's, again, there's ample discussion about if we should do this as a routine, or should we go with different ways, like studying an antibiotic uh, or having to switch antibiotics, let's say every 48 hours. Well, I know that this is all the time we have. So I want to uh, thank again to all of you, Julie, for setting up for the logistics and Maya, uh, for you to being so kind to inviting me. And also I know, I don't know if uh, Jason is here, but Jason Higgins, I have to mention him because uh, he works now for Viair and uh, uh, he graduated from our program. So that makes it the best program in the world. So thank you, Jason, for supporting also this webinar. And thank you, Ruben, for uh, the time and for answering um, all, all the questions. Uh, we will share with the attendees the recording of this webinar, which will be available to watch and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch all over again. Um, and with that, I wish everyone a good day, afternoon, or evening. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.